Every Friday morning, I walk into a renovated warehouse in downtown South Bend, Indiana. This slightly dilapidated building houses a drop-in center that serves a hot breakfast to the poor, vulnerable, and marginalized <coughs> of the community. This little haven, known as Our Lady of the Road, is run by the Catholic worker movement in the city. The Catholic workers who staff the center live in simplicity and solidarity with those whom they serve. Their mission is to serve with humility and love so that all guests recognize their dignity and come to know God's love for them. On any given Friday, the scene would look like this. At 8 a.m. on the dot, the front doors are unlocked and the, and the guests begin to filter in. There is no way to caricature them as a group because they are so diverse. There's a young couple holding on to their two-year-old son, their eyes on the ground and their lips sealed as they shuffle around the room to find a seat. There's an elderly gentleman with stark white hair and an unruly beard who is nearly blind and partially deaf, who has lived on the streets for years. He comes in shouting and pushes his way to his usual table. There's a young man sizing up the place, unfamiliar with it because it's his first visit. He reeks of cigarettes and alcohol and has a smug or even annoyed look when an overly perky volunteer offers to find him a seat and get him some coffee. I am weaving between the hundred or so people that have wandered in, and I am chatting with those <coughs> I recognize and offering assistance to those I do not. A guest I know pulls me aside and says her cancer is getting worse and asks if we can pray together. No sooner do we finish praying than I am pulled away to serve coffee. While I pour a cup for a new guest, he asks about what school I attend and rolls his eyes when I say that I study theology. You've got to be kidding. You waste your time on that at a fancy school? That's got nothing to do with anything. How are you going to get a job? <laughs> I shrug and tell him it's what I love and that I'm assured God holds the future in his hands. I make a few more rounds through the room, trying to meet eyes with the people I do not know, and greeting them with, good morning, and I'm happy you're here. As I finish my coffee duty, I meander to the laundry room, and am greeted by a guest I know well. He gives me a firm handshake and tells me he's been reading the Gospels, like we had previously discussed, and asks if I knew that it says in there that the poor are blessed, and just what is that supposed to mean? The morning continues with snippets of conversations with dozens of guests until breakfast has been served and people are petering out. As I mop the floor and a guest who has volunteered to help out finishes washing the last of the dishes, we chit chat about sports and the weather until he finally asks why I'm at the drop. I tell him, I love it here because I get to share the love of God with the children of God. He chuckles because he thinks I am too idealistic but he offers a muffled, God bless you, as he makes his exit, and we lock up for the day. This is the typical experience of staff and volunteers. We share in this common ministry, and although every week looks different, the patterns are the same. Encountering a slew of different people, each with his or her own story. I never know how a given interaction will go whether I'll be invited into an intimate conversation about someone's life, or I'll be asked to please walk away and stop bothering someone, thank you very much. I might get to engage in a discussion on scripture or might instead talk about football and the weather. <coughs> no matter who I encounter or what the interaction looks like, I do my best not to waver from my aforementioned mission, spreading the love of God to the children of God. This may be met with joy, skepticism, gratitude, or frustration, but that is the risk of ministry. Witnessing to God, no matter the way we may be perceived or received. This risk-taking and sharing the good news is exactly what Christ calls us to in the gospel passage we heard today. God does not tell us to share the word only with those we know will receive it well. In fact, God does not put any limits on who should hear the word. 
In fact, just as the sower sows seed on all types of ground, not meticulously choosing the places he imagines are best suited to fertile growth, but freely spreading the seed everywhere, so too are we called to spread the word <coughs> to all people. At the drop-in center, we could be throwing seed in every corner, only to learn it has fallen on rocky ground or in a patch of thorns. But it's not up to me or anyone else to decide where we plant the seed, only to decide whether or not we try to spread it. It is not in our hands to put limits on the infinite and omniscient God. Instead, it's our duty to spread God's word far and wide in the hopes that somewhere it will take root. For the light of Christ is not meant to be put under a bushel basket, but instead should shine freely and brightly from the lampstand. One of the reasons we are not charged with choosing the right place to spread the word is because our human eyes cannot always spot the best soil. What looks to us like arid desert may actually have an undercurrent of living water. One such example is a gentleman from the drop-in center named Eric. Eric is a man in his 30s with a strong southern accent and a smile that cannot be wiped from his face. He has a zeal for life and a disposition of gratitude that many would emulate. His love for and trust in God are deep and true. But he wasn't always this way. Until fairly recently, Eric was living on the streets of South Bend. After his addictions robbed him of his job and his stability, he was left homeless and distraught, alone and abandoned by his family and his friends. He felt unworthy and broken, and his negative behavior spiraled. That is until one day, when by the grace of God, he was led to Our Lady of the Road. Eric stumbled upon the drop-in one Friday morning, as many people do. He was down and out, visibly in need of clothing, food, and shelter. More importantly, he was in need of love. He was in need of God. Thanks be to God, Eric had a positive first encounter at the worker. He felt welcomed and dignified by staff and volunteers who treated him with respect. He felt encouraged to return again, and over the course of several weeks, was slowly reminded of the goodness of God that he used to know but that had faded from his memory in the midst of hardship. If you had passed Eric on the street a few months ago, you might not have even thought twice. He bore the invisible labels of homeless, addict, and ex-convict, labels that society gave him that prevented him from being his true self. After getting off the streets and joining the community of the worker, Eric is alive with the spirit and is a beacon of light and hope for others. He is flourishing in community life and is daily growing in his relationship with God. Eric is living and breathing proof that we cannot know the plans of God for others and that we must willingly be God's hands and feet, lips and voice, sowing the good news everywhere we go to everyone we encounter. The good news is not just for our family, our friends, our churches. We are not making tiny, neat gardens to admire. We are throwing the seeds of good news as far as they can reach. Eric might have appeared to our fallen human eyes to be arid desert, or maybe a field too full of weeds for anything good to grow. But deep down, his soul was fertile ground that desperately awaited the seeds of the word, the seeds of life. To me, this story makes clear the need for all of us as disciples of Christ to spread the word more freely and more often. The mission of disseminating the word comes in the form of both speaking the name and message of Jesus Christ and in offering a living witness to it by our actions. First, we cannot underestimate the need for and power in speaking the name of Jesus and leading others to God's word. The scriptures are a powerful resource that give guidance in times of both joy and hardship. Many people in the world are in need of guidance, reassurance, and hope. Being able to speak 
the word of God into someone's life is a gift and a responsibility that we have. As faithful Christians, we are holding the seeds. They cannot stay buried in our pockets or clenched in our fist. The seeds are certainly given to us to be spread. But an important thing to remember here is our words cannot be empty. We cannot simply keep the word on our lips, but instead have to let it infiltrate the fullness of our lives. We may encounter people whose hearts are hardened to the name of God. We may meet people in our ministries who have been hurt by the church or who feel abandoned by God because of loss or hardship throughout their lives. Sometimes it may even come down to a language barrier in which we cannot verbally communicate the word to someone we serve. Each of these experiences affords us an opportunity to show the love of God by our very being. When our actions of service are motivated by our love for God and neighbor, we are a living witness of Christ's love for humanity. We are planting a seed in someone's heart. We cannot underestimate the power of this because we do not know the long-term effect it could have. Perhaps it becomes a small blip on the radar and the person we have served and loved soon forgets. The seed does not take root. Or perhaps it becomes the gateway. Perhaps like Eric, a chance encounter leads to deeper self-evaluation and reflection and ultimately spiritual growth. When we spread the seeds, we do not know where they will fall or what fruit they will bear, but that cannot stop us from spreading it. I would like to close by reading an excerpt of a prayer composed by Bishop Untner and often attributed to Oscar Romero. To me, it offers the most concise and beautiful insight into this challenge of freely doing God's work without knowing its full effects. Bishop Untner writes, this is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own.